This was absolute madness. Why did I think this would be a good idea? Efficient leveling. Why did why did Bethesda think this would be a good idea? I, I understand that they were trying to get some sort of verisimilitude with the idea of leveling up. You you increase your attributes based on the things that you actually do in the game, but I I, I can't help but think that on some level they knew that someone like me was going to come along and try to maximize the efficiency of it. I, I can't be the only one. There's databases all over the internet about this. We'll tuck in, everyone. This is going to be your viewing pleasure for the evening. Don't worry, I'm only going to try and get athletics up to uh, 20, 25. Let's see, what, what am I rocking at right now? Oh, okay, 15. So yeah, we're just, we're not going to do this entirely. Acrobatics and light armor can also, also be leveled up, and speed is not going to be the primary focus of leveling. Uh, but we're going to have a lot of leveling ahead of us before we move ahead any further with character development or uh, plot progression. So, tuck in. And I hope you're all ready to uh, dance uh, with the, the madness that is this segment. Kurt Saxon wrote a lot about madness, the, the madness of a society that had embraced decadence and weakness, uh, the, uh, the, the madness that our society uh, encouraged. In fact, he wrote about his own time working in an insane asylum, and I'd like to share that with you all tonight. That seemed appropriate for this, at least for this one part where I will definitely be swimming swimming across all of a, a Cyrodiil. Let's see. Yeah, Cyrodiil, that's what Oblivion is situated in, right? Yes. All right, yeah. Tuck in, everyone. There's going to be quite a bit of swimming. Uh, we won't be turning in that major staff until level 16. Wait, is that... What is that? Did I just see something over there? Was that a cave? No, that was a rock. That was a rock. I... <laughs> Silly me. I For a second, I thought there might be some point to playing an Argonian. But maybe it's best if I just let Mr. Kurt Saxon... Uh, take it away with this one, talking about his time in an insane asylum. Uh, not all the episodes have the best callers, uh, but all of his uh, episodes do definitely have great, uh, shall I say, tangents of his. And this one is no different. Uh, while there are some technical difficulties uh, for this particular episode of his, uh, I, I don't think it really detracts from the pleasure that one can feel when enjoying it. So, as I circle around the bend perhaps it's time we all sit down get nice and cozy and tuck in for another one of mr saxon's wonderful rousing tales so without further ado take it away mr saxon sail me down that sweet mississippi river Welcome to the Kurt Saxon Show, your countdown to the future. First, I want you to take down my phone number in case you want to call. The number is 501-437-2963. In case you didn't get it, here it is again. 501-437-2963. Sorry, but we can't accept collect calls. First, I'm going to share with you my editorial, The Nuthouse Syndrome. It's in issue two of U.S. Militia. When it's over, dial the number. The Nuthouse Syndrome. 
In June of 1964, I got work as a psychiatric aide at the Arizona State Hospital. I was a nuthouse attendant. There I was my brother's keeper, and a good one. The patients were confined and being treated. Regardless of what they had done, they were now harmless, and society had agreed to take care of them. Most of the patients were simply unable to manage their affairs and otherwise care for themselves. Others had been violent. By 1964, tranquilizers had been developed, which would calm the most violent. This made them easy to handle, but was no cure. Once the tranquilizers had worn off, the delusions of persecution would return, and they would again consider all those around them to be enemies. It was hoped that even the worst could finally be released with pills which they could be trusted to take. Sometimes this worked, but many released patients would forget to self-medicate or they believed they were all right without them. As the medication wore off, the released patient would again become delusional and overreact to the slightest indication that people around him were working against him. This was so gradual that only the most intelligent released patient realized that the medication was wearing off and he had to take more. The less intelligent, especially those in the lower economic brackets, were often released back into hostile environments with justified beliefs that enemies abounded. Many stopped taking their medications because they believed their doctors were deliberately putting them off guard so their enemies could get at them. Paranoid George is a case in point. He's one of the main characters in Wheels of Rage, serialized in U.S. militia. He was in a constant state of agitation and depression. I gave him eight ounces of tranquility when it was a tea instead of in its present caplet form. After about five minutes, he was flying. He thought it was the best dope. For George, feeling normal was feeling high. I gave him some of the compound to brew for himself. I talked to him a few days later, and he was a different person. He could think clearly, and all his hostility was gone. Two weeks later, I met him again, and he was just as nutty as ever. I asked him why he'd stopped taking the herb. He said it kept him from being aware of the people acting against him. George was clinically insane. He should have been confined. His illness was worse than depression, so tranquilizers weren't enough. Like most of the truly insane, he couldn't be trusted to self-medicate. When I worked at the hospital, I saw the most violent people come in, enraged and fighting. After a few days on tranquilizers, they were calm and not at all troublesome. This was promising, and many in the mental health field even exaggerated the effects to impress those politicians who could legislate more funding. In 1964, the mentally ill were confined as well as the criminals. It's a fact that the great majority of harmful people running loose today would have been in mental hospitals or prisons then. But as our population has increased and our economy has suffered because of it, the mental hospitals and prisons have suffered underfunding. This led to understaffing. Along with it came overcrowding, as more of the moronic and unfit had more unfit and moronic offspring. Possibly because of the surface effects of the tranquilizers, politicians and social workers overreacted. With no experience with mental patients, they decided to release those patients who had not been violent since being treated with tranquilizers. They couldn't be convinced that these patients were not to be trusted to self-medicate. Their optimism was reinforced by the knowledge of how much the state could save if thousands of mental patients could be released. So hundreds of thousands of mental patients were released at great savings to the institutions. The heads of departments enjoying these savings boasted and were praised as good managers of the state's economy. Meanwhile, the released mental patients became a larger and larger police problem. They are mostly homeless, often violent, and they don't take their medications. Moreover, their ignorant criminality early on began to overlap the simple, thievery, and casual violence of the common punk at odds with society from childhood. In, sh in a short time, many crimes were seen as being caused by diminished capacity. Rape was not for sex by losers, but out of hatred and the urge to hurt. Robbery did not end with the taking of the victim's money, but was too often followed by unnecessary harm and even murder. So much of crime was irrational that the attitudes of the police were changed from enforcement to guardianship. Watch a few cop shows, those on-the-scene live patrols by real on-duty officers, and you'll see what I'm leading up to. The police officer is no longer a real cop, but a coast-to-coast -coast nuthouse attendant. You'll see the belligerent drunk, the dope, the mentally defective. Today's cop just does it just like I did in 1964. He protects and serves the inmates. 
What happens to decent citizens is regrettable, of course, but his patients are ill and need his care. What else can he do? The asylums and prisons are full. Crime must be kept in check by the drunk tank and the tranquilizer. The incurably hostile, the disadvantaged, the oppressed have rights the antisocial never enjoyed when society was sane. Then the warped, downbred vermin were isolated or destroyed. The drunk tank doesn't work anymore because one can't sleep off imbecility. Tranquilizers don't work because tranquility isn't wanted by those who war against civilization. Obvious is insanity is on the rise. So what used to be judged as criminality is seen as acts caused by mental illness and so must be excused and tolerated. The idea that one is innocent by reason of insanity has become entrenched in our justice system. This attitude has been helped along by the inability to confine the insane, criminal, or so set aside judgment. It should be obvious that no one in his right mind would choose to be a destructive, hated criminal over being a productive, respected member of society. So criminals are indeed insane. But society cannot long afford to excuse the dangerously unstable because they may or may not be responsible for their acts. And of course, the criminal is indeed being classed with the insane. For so long, we've heard about the growing number of mentally ill behind bars. The complaint was that as the mental institutions were being emptied, their violent rejects were being imprisoned. Overcrowding in the prisons caused the release of the criminally insane, and gradually the same attitudes toward the criminally insane were spread over the entire criminal population. So now, whoever commits any violent crime is given the benefit of the doubt as to his sanity. Regardless of the innocence or helplessness of his victim or the savage cruelty visited on his victim, the concern is for the criminal, lest his rights as a mentally handicapped citizen should be violated. And don't think the criminal doesn't know and take advantage of this attitude. He anticipates it and works it to the limit. The arresting officer knows it too. So while the criminal acts innocent by reason of insanity and the cop treats him as one who needs understanding, the victim lies there and bleeds. This attitude toward the criminal makes him immune to the law. He can rob, rape, maim, and kill almost with impunity. He can't be punished, as any act against him while confined can be considered cruel and unusual. He can't even be confined for long because there isn't room. He knows this. He knows that whatever he does against society, there's only a small chance that he will be caught. If caught, there's only a small chance he will be convicted. If convicted, there's only a small chance he'll serve time. And if he makes it to prison, he'll be released in a fraction of the time his sentence calls for. So we have tens of millions of people in our country who were born to no purpose but to consume and pollute and prey on their betters. They are mentally deficient, impossible to civilize, and are at the forefront of the revolt against civilization. Our government sees them as merely unfortunate, not really responsible for their acts. There is a room to confine them, even during their violent period. There isn't enough money to build enough nut houses and prisons to keep even the habitual criminals confined. So what to do? Our government, wanting to be fair, has decided to treat every citizen as an inmate and so institutionalizes everyone. The police are no longer enforcers of the law with the iron hand they once used against the harmful and the predatory. Instead, they act as nut house attendants, removing the dangerous only after a violent act and then only enough to temporarily medicate them. Then they are released back into the nonviolent ward of the institution. That's where you are. Say there is in your neighborhood a vicious dog that bites people and kills pets. You call the sheriff, but that's not really his job, but he'll get around to it in time. The pound is full, and besides, the dog will be hard to catch. You kill the dog or injure it so it will never come back into your neighborhood. Why not treat the two-legged animal the same way? Well, some people say he must be kept alive because he's a human being. But aren't his victims? And aren't there over five and a half billion human beings on our planet? Human beings aren't in short supply. Besides, their fertility ensures they're swamping our system with their degenerate kind, as some think they already have. But are they human in the first place? They are, consciously or unconsciously, at war with the rest of humanity. So the term human as a quality does not apply to them as compared with humans who aren't harmful and are productive members of society. I call them subhuman, and Lothrop Stoddard calls them underman. No matter, if a being is an active danger to his fellows, he ought to be confined or destroyed, regardless of what you might call him. Such people must be removed from society if society is to survive. 
and society will not survive if our country is run like a coast-to-coast -coast nut house. As it is, the mentally ill are threatening our system as a whole. Our species, Homo sapiens, is the only species which knowingly and consciously protects and nurtures its predators and parasites. The American people must make the conscious decision to remove those habitually destructive to society. They are known and recognizable. There should be no arguing about any cause for an individual's criminality or how he might be rendered harmless by a better environment. Once it's settled that there aren't enough cops, that what cops there are are really nuthouse attendants, and that more cops would only further institutionalize the rest of us, we can get down to business. That's where U.S. militia comes in. The average citizen has become cowed by threats of what will happen to him if he injures or kills a fellow nuthouse inmate. He's untrained in dealing with an attacker. He's afraid of losing his job, his family, and or his property if he deliberately rids society of a vicious predator. The U.S. militiamen will have no such worries. He will be well trained and able to serve the violent with the violence they serve others. He will be employed by U.S. militia and so will not fear losing anything. He will also know his chances of getting caught in an act against a criminal will be no greater than the criminal's chance of being caught in an act against a decent citizen. He will know that even if caught, his chances of being convicted will be slight, as the U.S. militia central will send a shyster to get him off. If worse should come to worst, he'll know his family is being cared for, and with good behavior and overcrowding, he'll be out in no time. In short, the U.S. militiamen will have an even better chance of getting away with violence against predators than the predators have now in their violence against good people. And since the powers that be have generally declared America to be a nuthouse, the U.S. militiamen will be treated with the same kindness and consideration as the unfortunate rapist, mugger, burglar, etc. that he does away with. The nuthouse syndrome is already upon us. So if the police can't protect the harmless inmates from the predatory inmates, they can't protect the predatory inmates from you. So join up and have a ball. All right, uh, now I'm going to give you the phone number to call and also the address to write down. Now the number is 501-437-2963. Now that's uh, 501-437-2963. Also write down this address, P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. Now I'm waiting for calls, so call in when you can. Now as I was uh, talking yesterday, I was describing my various books, and uh, I think you might like to hear about them. Uh, the one I ended with was Granddad's Wonderful Book of Chemistry. Now, that's more or less like the Rosetta Stone of chemistry. It's 19th and early 20th century chemistry that anyone can understand if they can read. It also has a 2,500-word dictionary of the old terms, uh, whereby you can interpret just about any old formula you find. And uh, the... What's in it is the original 19th century methods of home manufacturing for everyone. Make herbal extracts, essential oils, acids, gases, alkaloids, etc. Make most of the chemicals from easy to get raw materials, plus a complete course in laboratory glass blowing. Dick's Encyclopedia of Practical Recipes and Processes from 1872. Uh, that's a classic. The Medical Student's Manual of Chemistry from 1889. Then there's Chemical Magic, which is stage magic with chemicals from 1920. And then also how to make and use a small chemical laboratory from 1926. This way anyone can set up their own laboratory at home and really have a lot of fun and learn to make uh, highly saleable products. Uh, for use around the home or, like I said, to sell. And uh, also, now I, I might just as well go in and, and tell you about uh, the Poor Man's James Bond series, which is my most popular items, although I like the survivors better. Anyway, but probably the one you've heard about is the Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 1. Uh, it's a large book. Well, they're all large. They uh, have many pages, like, for instance, uh, they all have well over 400 pages. The Poor Man's James Bond, uh, New Improved, has 477 pages. 
and uh, it's full of uh, various books on weaponry, mainly hands-on weaponry that you can do yourself. Uh, one book in it is fireworks and explosives like Grandad used to make, explosives, matches, and fireworks, pyrotechny, that's Weingart's classic, American pyrotechnics, we shall fight in the streets, arson by electronics, U.S. Marines, and Army hand-to-hand -hand combat, plus making potassium cyanide, fire grenades, and the ultimate booby trap. Now, the ultimate booby trap is uh, made with iodine and ammonia, and that's the kind that you maybe have played with in school, where you mix iodine with ammonia, and uh, when it dries, it'll go off at a touch of the feather. Uh, anyway, uh, let's just see if uh, this is properly connected. Uh, could you check if that's connected properly? So we'll just hold on a minute because the flasher isn't working and I think maybe somebody might be trying to get through. And see, I, I feel sort of silly sitting around here talking and waiting for a call when it's disconnected. But, okay, it seems to be connected properly, so you people, okay, I'll give you my phone number again. Uh, the phone number is 501-437-2963. Okay, let's somebody call, anybody, please. I'm dying here. Actually, no, I can ramble on. Then, of course, there's the Poor Ben James Bond, Volume 2. And that's got five classics in one volume. It's 440 pages long. It's got The Chemistry of Powder and Explosives by Tenney Davis from 1943. It's got American Jiu-Jitsu from 1942. Then it's got Chemicals in War from 1937. And that tells all about poison gases. And actually, you could make a lot of them in the home. But you want to ventilate the place pretty good. And then it's got The Poor Man's Armorer. Now, the armorer, long out of print, but finally back with a whole arsenal of improvised weaponry, not in any other books. Homemade bazookas, silencers, booby traps, bolas, concealed weaponry, spear guns, smoke, gas grenades, mines, caltrops, an ingenious zip gun, plus Army Improvised Munitions Handbook, and much, much more. Now we go on to Volume 3. Uh, this has the Weaponeer, which at one time was a periodical, and now I uh, redid it and uh, put it in the volume four, I mean volume three, and that has 411 pages. And that has poison gas grenades, it has the wallet pistol, killer darts, poisons, bombs, explosives, silencers. Yes, it has Bill Holmes silencers from the wor home workshop. Uh, it's a very intricate one but it's one that's guaranteed to work and anyone can make it but he needs a lathe and uh, the book also includes ricin the deadliest organic poison known and its simple manufacture and then there's a very good book the gunsmith's manual from 1883 repair or reconstruct 19th century guns hand forge iron and steel for gun parts and knives case hardening tempering and annealing and then I've got uh, silencers from the home workshop, as I told you, from Bill Holmes. Then there's Knight's Mechanical Dictionary. That has military ordnance from 1884 uh, on back, way back to Egyptian times. And then there's booby traps from 1965. Uh, this would make your own territory impregnable. Uh, well, we found a loose connection here, so let me give you the number again. Uh, the number is 501-437-2963. Now we go to the Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 4. Uh, this has 460 pages, and it uh, starts out with Sapper, a specialist who lays, lays, detects, and disarms mines. It has a World War II British training officer's unpublished lectures and illustrations. It's got the Special Forces Handbook from 1965. It's got Operating in inter Enemy Territory. Then we got Viet Cong Mines and Booby Traps. 80% of U.S. casualties were by these. 
field expedient handbook, operating in no man's land, engineer soldier's handbook, which is about field fortifications, etc. Then there's modern gunsmithing, Clyde Baker, 1933, a classic, the best and most detailed gunsmithing course ever written. Then we've got Handloader's Manual. That's by Earl Naramore in 1937. It's another classic. It has the complete science of powders, cartridges, and an expert course in overall reloading. Now, then comes my tapes. Uh, I got the poor man's James Bond greets the Russians. This was made before the collapse of the communist empire. And it's 60 minutes color VHS for 1995. It's chillingly matter of fact about such subject as gas tank bombs, poisons, the hoped for slaughter of our Russian friends. Uh, we don't care about that slaughtering the Russians anymore. Who knows though, it, they, 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 this guy coming up, he might give us cause. And then uh, this tape drafts you into the increasing army of partisans, guerrillas, freedom fighters, and patriots preparing for foreign invaders or homegrown tyranny. I've, well, although parts of this tape are outrageously grim, other parts are outrageously funny. It's a very fun tape, actually. And then there's the poor man's James Bond strikes again. How to ensure a rich food supply, regardless of what might come. Extract your own highly poisonous nicotine. Make fangs and super fangs so you can reach out and touch someone with no fear of apprehension. And would you believe a fireball 50 feet high and 30 feet across from two quarts of gasoline initiated by 160 book match heads? Uh... Anyway, now, now I'll just go on talking about the shoestring entrepreneur because I didn't uh, really cover that. And uh, last night when we were on, about this time I was getting calls, and so I think maybe that uh, there's something wrong with the phone line. If I could ask my producer to pick up the other... No, I guess I can't. So I might just be ad-libbing all through this whole thing because I, I just have an idea that possibly the... Uh, phone is uh, out of order. It was working fine yesterday, but it's not working at all today. But, uh, well, what say I just start reading uh, uh, the editorial from uh, Shoestring Entrepreneur? Okay, uh, we'll, we, we'll, things are going to work out. Just hang in there. Try to call if you can. Anyway, I'll start reading uh, the shoestring entrepreneur uh, talking about a business for everyone. Now, if you don't have a business of your own and a, a depression-proof one at that, you'd better start thinking about one you can succeed at. You may have a job you think is secure. You may be between jobs. You may be of an age where you fear replacement. At any rate, if you have any awareness of the downturn in our economy, you need to think of how that downturn will affect you. To give you a factual awareness of the coming economic turmoil, I'm recommending a book, Bankruptcy 1995, The Coming Collapse of America, by Harry Figge, Jr., published by Little Brown in 1992. Get it from your library or through a bookstore. This book explains to anyone who can read how our government has taken on commitments which must be honored even at the sacrifice of our system, our civilization, and your children's future. Our system has up to 100 million social dependents, and the figure grows and grows, never decreasing. There are 35 million welfare recipients, 42 million Social Security recipients, and 20 million or more federal and state retirees. Funds set aside for these millions of mostly non-producers are called entitlements. The hundreds of billions of dollars given yearly as entitlements are added to the national debt of over four trillion. The debt can grow and grow without worrying most people. However, there is the interest on that debt. It must be paid. It's like your rent and utilities. You pay or you're on the street in the dark. In 1990, the interest was $252 billion. In 1995, it will be at least $619 billion. In 1995, our government won't collect enough by our present tax systems and other revenue sources. Then they'll really start cutting into the flesh of the economy and then even the entitlements. Whatever miracle you might imagine will save the system, Figgy's book will explain away any comforting optimism you might have for the near future. 
He does it professionally and objectively, like a doctor diagnosing cancer or AIDS. Of course, he holds out hope, like most doctors. The whole subtitle to his book is The Coming Collapse of America and How to Stop It. He may have added the remedies just to keep from causing a rash of suicides. I believe he's too intelligent intelligent and knowledgeable to take seriously the solutions he suggests. These are in part, vote, write your representatives in Washington, organize a letter writing campaign, become involved in a citizens actions group, etc. Most of the people who could do this are part of the problem, either corporate heads on the federal take or recipients of the entitlement. Then again, he may be sincere from his ivory tower point of view. But unless the powers that be can find an electable dictator who will write off a hundred million social dependents, you'd better start planning. Such planning should avoid the standard entrepreneurial attitudes about getting money. Such attitudes have, to some extent, gotten our economy into the mess it's in. These are attitudes which ignore production and concentrate on money for its own sake, discounting the need for economic stability. In 1986, I was invited to speak at a Doug Casey seminar in Aspen, Colorado. It was supposed to be a collection of entrepreneurs, innovators, imaginative thinkers. The people in that room must have represented $150 million or more. Yet, as I talked to them and listened to them talk to each other, I could only class them as collectively stupid. If they weren't talking about how to get money through some financial scheme having nothing to do with actual production, their every comment was shallow and uninteresting. They reminded me of a German moron I had read about. He had paid his taxes and figured out a simple scheme to get money without producing. I don't remember the figures, but let's say the German government taxed at a rate of 10%. They sent him a receipt for, say, 1,000 marks, showing anyone in the financial field that he had earned 10,000 marks. The next year, he worked at two menial jobs and lived like a rat to save as much money as he could. He was able to set by 10,000 marks and sent it all to the government as tax. They sent him his receipt for 10,000 marks, which was proof that he had earned 100,000 marks. He took that receipt from bank to bank with a story of his prospering business. The bankers could see nothing beyond the receipt and forked over several million marks in loans. He lived high until caught. I believe the Germans have since corrected their system of tax receipts as proof of earnings. Many of the Aspen entrepreneurs were no more clever than that moron. Each had a gimmick, a scheme, or else a newsletter sold to morons wanting a gimmick. I suppose most of them were legal, but the point is they had little idea of what caused the money, productivity. I told them they should buy auto repair shops, welding shops, woodworking shops, etc., and hire craftsmen to run them. Check out such places and see how long you have to wait in line to get something done. No one took me seriously, but I learned a lot from them. I learned that they were helpless and could not survive an economic collapse which would make their paper holdings worthless. On the other hand, those who own and know how to run such shops are raking it in and will do well when our inflated currency sinks to its actual value. Another thing I learned from them was their values were casual to the point of fraud. If the money they took in represented a loss to someone else, well, those were the breaks. The Japanese have a saying, success without honor is failure, profit without integrity is loss. A large part of our economy, and even our government, is run by failures and losers. People have taken dishonesty for granted for so long that it's hard for some to think about going into business without some angle or gimmick. The idea is to get money. Giving value for the money is secondary, if even considered. Giving value for the money is... Oh, sorry. Crookedness is accepted at all levels of our society. The wealthy crooks are heroic and smart. Move movies and TV glamorize them. Of course, our system is coming apart and tolerance by the public for criminality is wearing thin. Soon the law won't be able to protect the dishonest, so I see a time coming when honesty is not only the best policy, but the only safe policy. That being the case, shoestring entrepreneur will be slanted toward making an honest living from scratch, gaining independence from our foundering system and expanding. If you have the intelligence to make a profit for an employer, you have the intelligence to employ yourself. It's as simple as that.
An entrepreneur is one who creates his own business. He usually starts small. When I started, I was on aid for the totally dependent. And I'd still qualify if I had shared the attitudes of my fellow well welfare recipients. So I'm not putting out a twenty two hundred I'm not putting out a two hundred dollars a year newsletter telling you how to feel and deal and manipulate the system and its mo monetary policies. Each issue of Shoestring Entrepreneur will show you how you too can become independent of employers and cut loose from a system geared to fail. You can do this by supplying needs. The bound volumes of the survivor detail hundreds of trades, cottage industries, and home businesses. One advantage of these is that they are mostly Depression-era projects. So many today face the same urgency to become self-employed. The old entrepreneurs are easy to identify with. Such businesses were set up. <clears throat> excuse me. Such businesses were set up by hundreds of thousands of previously unemployed workers and managers who had very little money to start with. A lot of the emphasis was even on making their own tools at great ex at great savings. The practicality of starting a business from scratch is that you learn every step from the ground up. This gives you total control from the start. This will also prevent any dependence on people who may come along to help you as the business grows. People who let others do their thinking for them often get helped out of all they own after they've done all the real work. Some of the rewards of the shoestring system are the development of skills. When you choose items to make and market, it's best to make a sample or prototype. Don't think you have to go strictly by all the old plans. Many have materials no longer used. We have many materials better than used then. Just use the idea and the basic design. Otherwise, fit the idea to your market. This helps develop your natural creativity. Maybe you've never made anything before. You'd be surprised how hard and easy it is. You follow a plan and everything comes out crooked and weird. You just do it over. The second time you find it's easier and neater. After a few tries, you get it right and wonder how you could have been so clumsy with the first model. You've become skilled. Every succeeding project becomes easier and you find the more difficult projects seem worth a try after all. In time, you can look at most any old diagram and imagine yourself making a marketable product. And at first, you couldn't do anything, remember? Also, you'll see a practical value in many ideas you first saw only as novelties. Take the lap table, following this editorial. Few people have ever heard of a lap table, but once adopted, it becomes a necessity. On it, you keep all your smaller craft items in a compact space for working on your bed or while watching TV. My model has about three square feet of space and holds all sorts of materials for crafts and hobbies and for putting together your ideas. It's also for artwork, sewing, and just about everything you want to use it for. You don't have to gather up all your supplies each session or keep them on a table to themselves. This way you have everything together and can move the lap table around as needed and then set it out of the way on a shelf when not in use. It will teach children organization and neatness. It will also relieve the burden of mothers who yell at the little hobbyist to clear the table to make room for supper. Working this project will do several things for you. Maybe you've never done anything you weren't told to do. The biggest part of maturity is being self-directed. Making a simple lap table will show you that you can make something others will want. It will give you confidence that you can gain skills you thought only special people were born knowing. And if you can do this simple project, you will prove to yourself that you can master more complex projects. But the biggest thing you'll learn is that most people can't do anything unless someone else tells them to do it. You'll realize you're, part, you're apart from the herd and above it. You won't be afraid that you and yours will have to suffer along with those who look to others for direction. It might even frighten you at first, but you'll soon realize that we aren't all in this together. First, understand that my program is risk-free and no waste. If you have to buy the tools, there'll be tools you should have and will use often. The materials you use to make the projects are affordable even if you're on welfare. Say you buy the materials to make three lap tables. You keep one and use it to work out more projects. The other two you give as gifts, which you would have to have spent more on. You can't lose. 
When you've made all your mistakes on the first one, which you keep for yourself, the next will be much neater and the third will be good enough to show around at gift and hobby shops or whatever markets such as hospitals, rest homes, schools, colleges, etc. If you can't afford the shop machinery to mass produce, look up a woodworking shop and contract a dozen where they should be cut, drilled for about $2 a unit or less. Wholesale them for $8.50 or retail them for $15 and you'll clear a pop profit of from $3.50 to $8.50 each. With the right presentation, you'll be selling them by the hundreds. After selling a few dozen, you'll be able to afford real shop machinery and can turn them out at the rate of about 30 a day. With that machinery, you can tackle bigger projects and you'll have your own woodworking shop and independence. Once you learn you can do something, you don't have to limit yourself to working with wood. You have a choice, a choice of hundreds of trades, starting with projects as simple as a lap table and branching out. Then you'll want to fix on a line of business which will always be in demand, now and in a probably bleak future. Picture the economy getting as bad as you can imagine. What will people need? Just leaf through the bound volumes of the survivor and you can come up with hundreds of choices, any of which will make you a community asset. Even if you don't care to become really skilled and so don't care to make more than a prototype, you can hire others. You can either set up your own shop or farm the work out to people already set up. When I designed the country kitchen food dryer, I made only one and then turned the making of the rest over to a local woodworker. He turned them out 10 at a time for $25 a piece. I was selling them for $55. Then I got the 1943 plans for a better, better model based on the same principle which the reader could make for himself. See volume 8, number 7, page 125 of The Survivor. I could hardly publish the plans for that and still promote a lesser model. Publishing such knowledge is my top priority. Incidentally, you could make this dryer or have it made and sell for $100. It's better than any dryer on the market. Also, you could use it yourself to make jerky, dry fruits and vegetables or herbs and sell the products. As you plan your business, don't build images of drawbacks. Make your product for your own use first, then try it out on your friends. Find a market first and then consider any legal angles. Worry about licensing and such only after you start to make a taxable profit. Then consult your local chamber of commerce. They'll advise you about any licenses needed in your area. Whatever you do, don't ask anyone's permission to make and sell a product. If you have to deal with a bureaucrat at any level, never ask if it's legal to do what you're doing. You'd be surprised at how the usually mindless bureaucrat will dig and search and find some restriction. Instead of asking, tell the bureaucrat what you're up to and request any licensing forms for such a business in your county. I've never even done that and I've never had any trouble. Of course, I've made sure to get a state business license, but not before I was doing several hundred dollars a month in business. So don't worry about anything but perfecting your product and you won't have anything to worry about. Don't even worry about marketing. We'll deal with that later. Just remember, if you can make something or grow something and it's good, someone will buy it. And give this some thought. The only difference between a person who works for someone else and one who has his own business is persistence. If you've been the kind of person who will try something and then give, it, give up on it before you get it right, I'd like you to think very carefully on Ray Kroc's philosophy. He founded McDonald's Restaurant. That guy just kept on until now he's one of the world's richest men. What he did was basically very simple, and that was just keeping on. He wrote down his philosophy, and one of my readers sent it to me. I want you to ponder it and then apply it. Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Now that's it in a nutshell. Throughout all the survivors, if you've read them, you found that the people who really succeed are the ones who take a simple idea, something that fills a need, and work on it until they know how to do it right. Then they go out and promote it, whether it's word of mouth, door to door, advertising in magazines, or whatever. 
You can do it, but you've got to do it instead of just fantasizing about it. So persist. Your future may depend on it. Now, the phone is out of order during this show, uh, it seems, and maybe I can reach over here and get it back going. I'm not sure I can, but give me just a couple of seconds. Oh, now we got it. You up? Hello? Hello, Kirk. Yes. Yes, finally I got through. Uh, there is apparently some sort of problem with your telephone. Well, I just fixed it. You did? Okay. Yes. Uh, the, the, the little I'd like to pass on a couple of comments, not necessarily germane to what you've been talking about uh, over the last few minutes here, uh, but a couple of various comments. Number one, first of all, congratulations on your new program. Why, well, thank you. I think it's wonderful. Uh, secondly, with respect to your publications, uh, I have a few of them. I have uh, the uh, Granddad's Chemistry book there. Whatever, I forget the full title of it. And I've got the Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 2. And I'd like to tell your listeners that uh, these books are very, very valuable. They are packed full of very useful information. And I do plan to get uh, the remaining books in the series as soon as I can. Are you there yet? I'm sure here, yes. Okay, great. Everything uh, is fine. Got a little quiet. Anyway, uh, the main reason I'm calling, though, has to do with your, the idea of the militia and this relentless attack on guns and gun ownership and everything else in, this, in our uh, nation. I noticed today in the USA Today uh, newspaper, uh, it says here, USA gun crisis, USA Today in all four sections today examines the explosion of gun violence in the 1990s. And they've essentially devoted the entire newspaper today to this issue of guns and gun violence and gun control. And I'm getting, uh, probably along with millions of other people, I hope, very, very concerned about this, uh, the, this relentless attack on our Second Amendment. And the, uh, something I'd like to hopefully uh, make people aware of, if they're not already, already aware of it, when they talk about the uh, Second Amendment and so forth, the media talks typically about hunters and uh, target shooters and things like this, uh, which is not correct. That's not why the Second Amendment is in the Bill of Rights. And secondly, they make mention, or whenever mention of militia is brought up, they refer to the National Guard and things like that. Now, if you would permit me to read something very short here, Okay. Uh, I think it will shed some very interesting light on this issue. Okay. Uh, with respect to the, or with reference to the Declaration of Independence, I'm reading this. The immortal document, which is justly regarded as the Charter of American Freedom, freedom had its prototype in a Declaration of Rights prepared by Thomas Jefferson and adopted by the Virginia legisl Legislature on June 12, 1776. Uh, and then it says as follows. There's a brief one-sentence preamble here. It says, A declaration of rights made by the representation of the good people of Virginia, assembled in full and free convention, which rights do pertain to them and their posterity as the basis and foundation of government. All right, and there are a total of uh, 16 rights, but I would like to read the 13th one. Which well, make it short. I will do that. It says this, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. So uh, if you believe that Thomas Jefferson had anything to do with the establishment of our government, those are his words, and that's what he had in mind with respect to the Second Amendment. And finally, one last line by Jefferson it says, The strongest reason, this is another quote, The strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny and government. That's by Thomas Jefferson. Yes. So for those people out there that think uh, the militia already exists in the form of National Guard and so forth, uh, that's baloney. We are the militia. That's right. Well, that's what I'm trying to set up. But you see, this whole thing uh, is partly of what I was, was talking about with the Nuthouse Syndrome. 
Now, when I was a nuthouse attendant, I was totally for absolute gun control and confiscation from anybody in the nuthouse. I made sure they didn't have guns or knives or whatever, and I did a good job because nobody there was armed except with an occasional chair. And, uh, but you see, when you get outside and uh, they want to disarm the inmates living outside, it's, it's my uh, position that anyone who is not to be trusted with a gun should be confined. And if he is not uh, a danger to himself or to others, pronounced legally so by an official body of people who know that, then uh, he can't be deprived of any sort of weapon. So I think that if they should ever try to exercise any sort of actual gun confiscation, there would be millions of lawsuits against the state, community, whatever, uh, demanding proof that the individual was judge to to himself or others you got that yes i do yeah i I, th I think the whole thing is crazy and uh it actually see did i tell you about thomas dodd well senator thomas dodd in the 60s uh came out with the most restrictive gun laws since the uh outlawing of the tommy gun or the silencer in the 30s and at that time, there were about uh, 50 million rifles, shotguns, and handguns owned by civilians. And uh, today, there are over 200 million rifles, shotguns, and handguns owned by civilians. And if they were going to, to really do something about it, why haven't they? I don't think they can, really. Uh, it's way out of control. Now, people are very much afraid that the ATF is going to come around and, and take their guns. Well, the ATF tried to take the guns from the people in Waco. Now, if the ATF should start taking guns the way they do, uh, I think they'd be wiped out in about six blocks. It just wouldn't work. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think you need to worry about your gun being confiscated. Also, you see, if, tenor, if, if Senator Dodd were alive today and should go to any gun show... He would be amazed at the armaments at any local gun show. Uh, have, uh, the individual today has access to much greater firepower than the Tommy gun. And uh, up until a few years ago, he could buy components for silencers, which had been outlawed. But, of course, with Bill Holmes' uh, book on the homemade silencers, a, per a person can uh, make a silencer in a few minutes, and if he feels the need to use it, he can use it, and then he destroys it. There's no real reason to fear any repercussions from having such weapons. Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't worry too much about confiscation of weapons, because I think that's just to appease the, the, the silly liberals that uh, want to institutionalize us all. And I know that they would love to institutionalize us all, and they're trying, but that our government is so corrupt and so messed up, they really can't do anything. Now look at the circus in the White House. These people are never going to do anything, no matter how much they shout and threaten. Like, take, for instance, California. They have over 300,000 semi-automatic weapons, assault rifles and such like that. And it's the law that says that they have to register them. Yet, up until the last time I talked to someone back there who knows about it, there hasn't been more than about 15,000 registered. Now, when I first got my federal firearms license a few years ago, they sent me a small booklet on uh, gun laws. And as the time went on, uh, the booklet got bigger and bigger and bigger. But it's just a lot of laws. If they can't Excuse enforce me. them, then it's no problem. So I wouldn't worry about that. I would worry more about... Uh, taking care of yourself and your family and organizing a community defense unit like uh, U.S. militia describes. Mm -hmm. And just don't worry about those dummies because it's like I said last night, uh, don't be afraid of your government. Be afraid because we have no government. <laughs> Good point. Last night uh, you mentioned that $10 packet that you could get. Yes. Uh, I haven't heard you mention that tonight. Well, I have. I, I didn't get around to it, and I was a little flustered by the fact that there, our, our phone uh, call-in thing was uh, temporarily disconnected. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> is, is that offer still on, though? Oh yes, yes, it certainly is. See, for ten dollars, you get a sample copy of U.S. Militia, 
and uh, a sample copy of Shoestring Entrepreneur, and also David Koresh's Last Testament. It's a very interesting book. He, he titled it uh, The Decoded Message of the Seven Seals of the Book of Revelation. But that title is sort of misleading since that was the title he intended to use. However, he didn't get beyond the first seal. But it's a very interesting book, and uh, it has poems by him, uh, articles by him. It's got his letter to the FBI and his letter to his lawyer, and it's got pictures and quotes from, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, he's our president. Uh, yeah, Bill Clinton. <laughs> It says, I hope very much that others who will be tempted to join cults and to become involved with people like David Koresh will be deterred by the horrible scenes they have seen. President Bill Clinton. I wonder who wrote that for him. But uh, we, we don't have a government anymore. I mean, everybody's afraid of the FBI and the ATF. The ATF has less than 5,000 agents. The FBI has less than 8,000 agents. And uh, they have so much of a job in this phony drug war and uh, all of the, the, the rest of the, the cranked up crimes that uh, they can't do anything. I mean, that, that's part of the reason the crime rate has gotten out of hand. Uh, aside from the fact that uh, crime is a big business for the government, uh, it's just it's like the inmates are running the asylum. It really is. Uh, I agree. Uh very quickly, I'm going to get off the, home, the phone here, but uh, just to check on your address, it's P.O. Box 95. P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. You send the $10, and I'll send you this packet of very readable material. And even more, uh, when, you, when you get it, uh, you, all you got to do is send in an order for a subscription to U.S. Militia or Shoestring Entrepreneur, and you get $5 a credit on that. See? So the packet only costs you $5. I can't imagine anyone getting the packet and not wanting to get more because I've got a regular regular library of uh, uh, materials that anyone can apply, even if they're in a wheelchair. So my stuff is really universal. It takes you back to a uh, very good lifestyle like your great grandparents enjoyed. And of course, uh, when this lifestyle is done away with, uh, those of us who prevail and we will prevail can start out and, and inaugurate the next step in the evolution of human civilization. So I say, uh, don't worry about what's going to happen. Just worry about that it might happen to you and make sure that it doesn't. Because when uh, you've overridden this chaos to come, uh, your children will found dynasties, big businesses, because everything will be free for the taking. The cities will be burned out. Uh, the government will cease to exist. It's just about ceased to exist anyway. I mean, with the Clintons in power, my goodness, I've... You see, I, I'm 61 years old, and I knew something about government most of my life. And if you had told me when I was 20 that such a pack of ignoramuses could be in the government now, oh, that's just terrible. Kurt, what kind of time horizon do you see for things falling apart completely? Well, if you had, were you able to listen to my reading of the editorial and uh, business for everyone? No, I didn't. I didn't catch that. Oh, you. Oh, you. Well, I hope it was on. Anyway, what you ought to do is, is get uh, uh, the book Bankruptcy 1995, The Coming Collapse of America by Harry Figgy Jr. I have that. You've got it. Well, okay, that should give you a pretty good timetable by 1995. And he's not the only one. Many people predict about 1995. It's, it's just, no, I, I don't want you to say that he said it, so that makes it gospel. Many, many other people in a position to know have said that by about 1995, this Disneyland for dummies is going to close down. And then it's going to be every man for his, uh, well, every man for himself and let the devil take the hindmost. Uh -huh. And so that, that'll be your time to really start something. But you better start something now to live through it. Yes. And you Wait, Kurt, I'm going to hang up. Uh, thank you very much, and keep up the good work, and God bless you. Well, thank you I'll very listen. much. I'll listen to you on the radio. Okay, bye for now. Good night. <clears throat> well, it's just about sign-off time, and uh, I hope you will write to me at P.O. Box 95, 
Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. Send in $10, and I guarantee you'll get a packet of material you really love. So well, how much time do we have? Okay, two and a half minutes. Okay, hello? Yes, hello, Kurt. Hi there. Uh, the reason I'm calling is I just managed to uh, start listening to your show the last uh, couple of nights, and uh, I'm a little confused as to when you're on and what stations you're on. Evidently, you're on uh, at different times and on different frequencies. Well, right now, uh, I'm on uh, WWCR out of Nashville, Tennessee, and, and from, from 6 o'clock till 7 uh, Central Time, and uh, that's at uh, five point eight one zero. Yeah. Uh, th then they repeat it uh, on another station. Uh, I got you the other night uh, at ten p.m. on seven point four three five. Yes, that's the one. It should be broadcast again tonight. And I hope that uh, uh, very soon we'll have all the bugs worked out, and we'll have the phone, uh, the incoming phone, connected properly. I don't know what happened to it this time, but all I had to do was jiggle it, and it worked. Now, I was talking to someone in uh, Idaho who said he gets you very late at night, one or two. Well, they repeat the program. They're going to do that for a couple of weeks just to see how well it uh, does on the different uh, stations. And then uh, they may jump me up to that time or leave me on this time. Well, I'm picking you up loud and clear in Long Island, New York. And well, that's I, good. On both frequencies, loud and clear. Yes. Oh, that's great. Enjoy the show, and uh, I, I hope you uh, to uh, do some steady listening to you. Well, oh, I, I hope you do, and uh, I'll be on again tomorrow. I'll be on every weeknight. So I'm, I'm going to finally uh, work this out so that we don't have any more production problems. More power to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now it's sign-off time. I'll talk to you tomorrow. So this is Kurt Saxon saying goodbye and be good. Study the tape and study your own attitudes and your own skill. Take stock of everything because what we're messing with is more than dynamite. It could be your life.